Hello and welcome. I'm going to do something today that I haven't done before and I hope you'll bear with me because I've no idea how long it will take and it's going to be a rather unusual format. But it's prompted by the fact that um, uh, that Jordan Peterson has given a new interview to a man called Jonathan Padjo. Uh, Jordan's been ill, as you know, and has had the greatest difficulty in regaining his physical health and his mental equilibrium. And for a lot of us, one of the questions we've been asking over the last couple of years is, does Jordan Peterson believe in God? Is he a Christian? How is it that he's managing to be so enormously competent in conveying the faith or bits of the faith to people in a way that um, people like me haven't been able to do, the clergy in particular? Uh, a couple of Catholic theologians have just written a book critiquing his excellent um, lectures on the Old Testament and saying how is it he manages to gain uh, an audience of, of hundreds of thousands whilst we uh, only get dozens if that and the answer is because of course the church has lost its way in the last three or four hundred years by it's been seduced by a particular rational culture an empirical and rational culture and it's lost touch with with the enormous power of its own resources, in particular the stories and the narratives in the Bible. Jordan Peterson has discovered them. And so not being a Christian, not believing in God, exactly well, we'll look into that during this conversation. He has presented the existential authority and the integrity of the narratives he's found in the Bible because they're archetypically true. Now, what's an archetype? Uh, an archetype is a model or a pattern or a person or an image that is, has a universal applicability to everybody. So the saviour archetype, um, Frodo in Lord of the Rings is a, is a saviour archetype. He goes heroically on a rescue mission and with all the right courageous uh, um, elements of his personality, he saves the day. Uh, and so psychologically speaking, Jesus is seen by people like Peterson as an archetype in that Jesus is true, he's real, but he's real as an archetype, but not as the saviour. He, what he says is true and, and how he presents it is true, but, but not in terms of personal relationship with him. And it's this move, this shift from Jesus as being true archetypically as a saviour figure to Jesus as my saviour, my truth, my way, my life, that is the leap that Peterson has yet to make. What I want to do today is to do something that's um, a bit unusual. <laughs> I hope I'll be able to do it in a convincing way that carries you with me. I want to look at the readings that we have for the second, uh, the second week of Lent, which are the Transfiguration. Now, this is really interesting because um, for those of us who are Christians, what the lectionary has taken us from a confrontation with Satan that leaves many people being very uncomfortable. It's so vivid. It treats Satan as so real. Uh, and, and so so pungent and damaging, so in your face, in a way that people find very difficult to talk about, partly because um, Jordan Peterson's psychological colleagues have rubbished the idea of evil uh, as it's come through, particularly through Freud and, and through Jung. We'll talk about Jung and evil later on. Um, and so the, the readings begin last week, one of of, of Lent with Satan and then this week, the week, week two, that's just gone past with the transfiguration. And if like me you, you look at the lectionary and you say what is, what's the transfiguration doing? How, we, how is it we're going from, um, from an encounter with Satan to this encounter on the mountaintop where Jesus is, where, where it's almost as if heaven opens and Jesus as he really is beyond time and space suddenly gets presented to us. Why is the lectionary doing that? I suddenly found myself asking that as I was preparing for my kind of normal weekly presentation. And then as I read, as I saw Jonathan Padgett's interview with Jordan Peterson, I thought, well, maybe we can pull the two together because why does lectionary do that? It, it takes two very important elements that belong in our Christian understanding of who we are, and it invites us to confront them both. So it shows us raw evil, a confrontation with Satan that is not just the one, not just Jesus's, but it's ours. 
he answers on our behalf, but we ourselves find ourselves beset by Satan. The baptism vows are, uh, I, I turn to Christ, I repent of my sins, I renounce evil. It should be the evil one. It's a very, our relationship with Satan is almost as personal as our relationship with Jesus because it's, a, it's an encounter of distortion and dysfunctionality, of, of temptation and disorder that's very personal. Uh, and only if we take evil seriously and as we struggle with evil outside ourselves and inside ourselves, as we struggle with evil in our mind and in our heart, as we struggle with evil that is structural and evil that is metaphysical, only so can we begin to make sense of what the Christianity teaches and, of, and, and receiving Jesus as our saviour. So we have on the one hand this encounter with real evil, real Satan, real demons, the angelic world. The angels came and ministered to him, it told us last week, after he'd confronted Satan on our behalf. And at the same time, this astonishing event on top of the mountain, witnessed only by James and John and Peter, where Jesus glows with this, this nuclear holiness that's going to prefigure the resurrection. And, and also, astonishingly, involves Moses and Elijah. Suddenly, the whole Enlightenment project in, in Newtonian terms, as we've known it for the last three or four, is ripped apart. <laughs> and, and suddenly, time and the time-space continuum, helpfully joined together by, by Einstein, time and space belong as, as one, one phenomenon it, it's, it's not only bent, it's ripped open and Moses and Elijah are there telling us that, that our perception of time and space as being uh, all-encompassing, as being the yardstick for everything real, is wrong. Actually, time and space are permeable. Heaven breaks through. The Jesus event, the incarnation, is Jesus breaking through into time and space. He kind of he rips it open. Mary's womb, Mary's Mary's the, the, the Mary event, the incarnation, is the ripping open of time and space and the placing of eternity in. And eternity is going to break open time and space from the inside as Jesus is born. And and we see an intimation of that as Moses and Elijah appear on the mountaintop and Jesus is transfigured. And we suddenly see that time and space is bounded by eternity. Eternity, non-time, non-space, lies on one side of it in the, the, what we might call the beginning, except, of course, that outside time and space there is no beginning. If, the, if, ever, you get, if ever you get worried about the, well, you believe in God. Um, so, you know... What was before God? I heard Christopher Hitchens in a, in a debate I saw him do, uh, I relived the other day, uh, offer this old canal. And the answer is, of course, that's impossible. Our minds blow up. Uh, what is before God? Well, there has to be a God before God, doesn't there? And so you get this end of cycle. But of course, there is no before. Before only belongs in time and space. You can only ask before questions in time and space. If what is outside time and space blows time and space open. There is no before, there is no after, there is, there is only is. Which is partly why God's name is so exciting at the burning bush. I am that I am, I will be that I will be, I was what I was. That is a, a, a threat to time and space. It is limited. When God breaks into it, it is, it is contingent. It is temporary. The time-space continuum is going to be enfolded and dissolved by something much, much bigger. So that's what the transfiguration begins to warn us is going to happen. Two things then. Evil on the one hand, which we have to take seriously and treat realistically, and if you like, literally. And a Jesus who is going to break open time and space and rescue us personally. And, and, and only as we deal with these two things can we then find some of the answers to the questions that Jordan Peterson is going to raise. So what I want to do now is to, is to because not everyone, it may be that some people will, will listen to this who haven't come to uh, uh, to, to, to my, my catechesis uh, before. And so I'm going to read the bit of the Transfiguration and I want to go through the interview with Jonathan Pancho. So at this, at this point, I'm going to become a bit more lame and as I start beginning to read from a text, I hope you'll forgive me uh, as it becomes more truncated. 
But let's go to the text that we have for the second Sunday in Lent. It's, it's written in St Mark. So Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone by themselves. And there in his presence he was transfigured. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than any earthly bleacher could make them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. And a cloud came covering them in shadow and there came a voice from the cloud. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then suddenly when they looked round, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, he warned them to tell no one what they'd seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They observed the warning faithfully, though amongst themselves they discussed what rising the, from the dead could mean. Now, normally I'd want to start talking about Moses and Elijah and, and, and what the transfiguration meant, but, but instead I want to begin with Jesus binding them to silence as we go into this interview between Jonathan and, and Jordan. Uh, because, and I, let me declare an interest here, uh, I, 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 for, for, for 20 years I, I taught psychology in university, I, I wasn't as competent a psychologist as Jordan Peterson was, who was a clinical psychologist and a full-time professional therapist uh, and an experimental psychologist, he did brought in a certain amount of hard-nosed science into his psychology, but nonetheless I taught the psychology of religion and, and developmental psychology and, and Freud and Jung and so I first came across Jordan Peterson whilst I was also a psych professor uh, and saw his maps of meaning and thought, wow, this man has got to what I wanted to do early, earlier than I had. I was very impressed with his work. Uh, and then, of course, the next time I saw him was when he was uh, confronting section C16 in the, the Canadian leg legislature were planning to impose and to demand a certain form of speech. And then Jordan Peterson erupted on the world stage and it was quite extraordinary to see what happened. And, and he's burnt out. He's, he's been attacked and he, he's been attacked not just by, uh, well, who has he been attacked by? That's one of the interesting questions, isn't it? He has enraged the woke left and delighted a whole load of people who have instinctively known that what he stood for and what he was saying was true but didn't know how to articulate it didn't know how to defend it, and didn't have the intellectual perspicacity to see through the holes in the left's argument. And wokery, wokery is a terrible system. It, it's it, this representation of Marxism is immensely dangerous to us because it's a form of utopianism with no forgiveness. And, and, and in case you're, you know, you're, you're tempted to become woke, it, it values people by the categories they belong to, never because of the individual's individual worth of who we are. Now, this is where Christianity comes in, because Christianity, utterly wonderfully, doesn't see us as male, female, Jew, Greek, tall, small, ugly, beautiful, clever, stupid. It, it sees us as sacred because God made us. Each of us bears a fingerprint of God upon our soul, and it's unique. The, 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 the way God has made each of us is utterly unique. And we get forgiven. Now these are things that Wokery can't do and it's a terribly dangerous way of trying to improve society and it took Jordan Peterson to call it out and he called it out because he knew from his own world view because he'd read Solzhenitsyn and he'd read Dostoevsky and again he and I have a I, 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 <laughs> I vainly hope that one day he and I might have conversation. I would love it because we share so many things and I want to tell him about Jesus. I want to answer his questions. I have to say, Jonathan Paggio did a most wonderful job. So maybe it's done. Maybe it's done. But, but nonetheless, his conversation with Jonathan raised a number of issues and I, I want to expand them further, which is partly what I'm, what I'm planning to do now. I see we've got a quarter of an hour in and so this may turn out to be something of a lecture. I hope I'll be able to carry you with me. Um, but of course, the great thing about YouTube is, is if it gets boring, you can stop and start again. So the first thing I think we want to ask is why did Jordan Peterson get into such trouble? Why do you make people so angry? 
why have they sought to destroy him? Well, as a Christian, of course, we know that this isn't just people. When you stand up and speak for God and for the truth, for the way, the truth and the life, and Jordan Peterson has, by and large, 90% of what he's been saying has been Christianity. There's been a very interesting overlap because he's a Jungian. Uh, and for a while, I abandoned the, 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 the essence of Christianity, of Orthodox Christianity, and became a Jungian too. And one of the reasons why I feel so strongly and passionately in defence of Jordan Peterson and what he's been saying in the public space is because I've tried out Jung and it doesn't work. I gave up, G I, I, I didn't give up Jesus so much as I, 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 I slipped away from Jesus and flirted with Jung because I found certain questions too difficult and too painful to answer as an Orthodox Christian. And it's very interesting to me now that Jordan Peterson is talking about um, the fact that he too is finding it too painful and too difficult to know how to progress himself. For, for me, the issue was how on earth I told the difference between evil and mental illness. Uh, in my own personal life, uh, uh, my, my, my responsibilities, uh, I found that this challenge of distinguishing the presence of evil and the overlap between evil and mental illness, too difficult. And so I sidestepped and I gave up and I began, I, I took on, I took Jung's uh, worldview on board because Jung does, Jung sidesteps the whole thing. Now, Jung is one, <laughs> Jung is a Gnostic. Uh, he's a parasite on Christianity. He's a very clever, very wise, very insightful man who's made a kind of map of the psyche that corresponds to it in the way that the underground map corresponds to the tunnels under 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 the london in that it doesn't but it does so it's not a real map it's a it's a topographical map of connection and jung's understanding of the human psyche and human unconsciousness gives us a kind of topographical map of connection that's very close to the truth but at certain really important points takes us in utterly the wrong direction and 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 for me Jung's idea of the shadow uh, takes us in the wrong direction so I, I hope I can find my way in a, in a con logical and consequential way, way through this conversation to explain what happened so I, I, I gave up Jung when I was confronted by Satan again when I had the Jesus in the wilderness experience and Satan came after me and I had demonic assaults uh, and at that point I realized I'd forgotten that Satan was real. I'd forgotten that evil was real. I'd forgotten that as a Christian I had to renounce Satan personally. And I was involved in a personal struggle with demonic forces because I had become empirical, uh, intellectually more refined. I had, I had sidestepped a conflict I couldn't solve because it was too painful and too difficult. Let's go, if, you, if you're still with me, <laughs> let's go to the interview that Jonathan Pancho and Jordan had. Um, I don't think I'm likely to be able to have a conversation with Jordan Peterson, so this is as close as it may be that I'll be able to get. Let's start with the fact that Peterson asks, why is it I'm so utterly beaten up? Now, there's a medical reason and, and a psychological reason. The medical reason is that he found himself addicted to, to certain forms of drugs that were given to him as antidepressants. They're very reasonable drugs. They had a very bad reaction with his metabolism. And the other is that he's had people uh, defecating on him from a great height, uh, saying the most horrible things about him, trying to trap him, treating him as an evil man. He's a man of very kind good compassionate intention who's worked as a therapist and yet he's been seen to be so dangerous to the, the woke status quo that we have had we have had legions of people trying to destroy him because because they encounter him as dangerous and misrepresenting him deliberately trying to trap him so we can describe why he has has if you like fallen to pieces temporarily god god bless him god keep him god mend him we can describe it chemically because of the drugs. We can describe it 
uh, existentially, because who likes being attacked by people who hate you, misrepresent you? It, it's a pretty dreadful thing to have to happen to you. But I think we need to describe it spiritually too. Essentially what Pete, Peterson has done is he's set out to encounter and outface evil, but without the protection of Christ. This is a very dangerous thing to do. He's, he's become, if you like, like a lightning rod, but, but with no lightning rod for him. And what I mean by that is I think that we live in a particularly dangerous age spiritually. We live in an age when Christendom is being assaulted from everywhere. We live in an age where it may give way to some form of dictatorship in the form and the expression of this newfound cultural Marxist utopianism. We're losing our freedom of speech. Uh, there are jobs that I could never apply for now and get with my views on marriage and the sanctity of life and, and sexuality. All this has happened in the last 10 years. And from a Christian point of view, we have to see the destruction of the Judeo-Christian ethic, the silencing of Christians, the silencing of free speech. We have to see that as evil. It is a profound evil which is coming upon our society. And poor Jordan Peterson has stood up almost single-handed to confront it. And, and, and needless to say, um, been profoundly assaulted. And he's done it without being integrated into Jesus, without the spiritual protection that a Christian has, without the spiritual weapons. Now, he has formidable intellectual and psychological armoury, which he's used to the most wonderful extent. And I'm one of those who sat down with glee and clapped my hands and been enormously excited at the, at the gladiatorial way he's gone in to face very clever, very sophisticated sometimes well-meaning but sometimes malevolent people but he needed he needed and he needs more than that if you're going to take on cosmic evil you need what St Paul called the armour of the Holy Spirit you need something supernatural you need something more than empirical more than clever and the poor man has been utterly worn down his 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 he needed a thick skin but his skin has been stripped away from him leaving him raw because He's been trying to engage in a spiritual struggle without the right spiritual resources. I want Jordan Peterson to become a Christian. I wish I could sit down like Jonathan Paggio did. I mean, he did it so well uh, and compliment what Jonathan did in conversation with Jordan. And in a sense, that's partly what I, I hope this, this, what we're doing now is. So I'm going to turn to the interview and, and comment on it. I'll, I will, of course, put a, a link through to the interview in in the description below so that you can see it for yourselves. So Peterson asks um, why people have got so angry with him and the answer is because he's spoken up on behalf of, of truth and offered this, this journey to authenticity as he's been leading people through chaos to order, representing hierarchy over a flat utopian equality of outcome culture um, now he says his explanation is he thinks it makes people feel better to have an enemy and so and that's true of course so at one level that's another reason why he's been so attacked it does indeed help people who are frightened and insecure to feel they have an enemy um, uh, but that's not that's not the only reason now the, if you remember, I think a moment ago when I read the gospel, I said I wanted to come back in the text to Jesus saying, swearing the disciples to silence as they came down the mountainside. Now, those of you who know anything about the gospels know that, that there's something called the theologians talk about the messianic secret. Quite a lot of the time, Jesus swears his disciple to silence. He does these most extraordinary acts. He says, Don't tell anybody about it. And many people come to the Gospels and say, well, this is a bit odd. Surely he's come to self-disclose. To self -disclose. Why is he keeping silence about it? Why is he telling, you know, isn't the going... And the answer is, it's time and place. There's a time and place when he sends the disciples and the apostles out into the world saying, tell everybody, this is it, go for it. <laughs> be, be wholly explicit as to who I am or what I've come to do. But there was a period of time where... He didn't want the whole thing to blow up in his face uh, because the people weren't ready. The moment of his crucifixion 
wasn't the gate of he didn't want to precipitate a messianic revolution based on false precepts particularly politics and violence until it came to the moment now in a sense Peterson has, has, if you like, um, broken the silence that Jesus enjoined upon his disciples and told everyone about it. It's not a matter of time and space anymore, but it's not having the right credentials. Not being baptised in water and in spirit, not bringing to this cosmic confrontation that he has fronted the, the in Christness that the role he's been taking requires. He has been a Christ-like figure. He has been a messianic figure. He asks, why has this happened to me? And the answer is, well, we crucify messiahs. We destroy people who tell us too much truth. Uh, and if you're a Christian, you sign up for that. But he's not a Christian. He hasn't signed up for it, and he's bewildered by it because he doesn't have a worldview, a narrative that allows him to make sense of this suffering. And he's just been not for six we all find suffering immensely difficult to reconcile with a loving god but one of the things again i hope i'm going to be able to do is to look at what st paul says about suffering uh, and how we how we 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 wear we bear suffering for love's sake because we know that we know that we're being we're being crushed in this vice that is the confrontation of good and evil and we know it's the confrontation between good and evil that crushes us it is not god being careless or negligent or unloving it's what happens when people made in god's image encounter forces that hate that and and and, and have the upper hand in our world and if you don't understand that evil has the upper hand in our world, then the suffering doesn't make any sense at all. But if you do, then as this clash between good and evil come and we get caught in the middle, we get very badly squeezed, but we come out newborn, alive. Forgiveness will triumph over hatred. Love will triumph over anger and darkness. Hope will triumph over despair. But there's going to be a squeezing of the vice where we get caught and where it hurts very badly so as peterson says i've been dealing with religious issues but without being spiritually equipped and he says my conception of christ is one i don't understand and that's that's the key to what's going on here he grasps so much of the of the truth of the kingdom of heaven so much of the truth of reality so much of the of the the truth that's capable of being grasped by the mind by the well-meaning well-intentioned good mind but the key to all this is a relationship with christ to know who christ actually is and jordan peterson has not yet discovered who christ actually is he knows who he archetypically is he knows who he psychologically is how who he ethically is but he doesn't know he's the Logos come to die for Peterson's own sins on the cross to wash Peterson in the blood, to rescue him from Satan. So that on the last day, Peterson stands before the, the judgment with Jesus' arms round him and the devil saying, J'accuse, and Jesus saying, not guilty. And not because Peterson is not guilty, because like all of us, he is. He's failed the moral tests. We've all failed them many many tackle passing we've all been weighed in the balance and found wanting even someone as clever and as good and i have to say at the moment and as frightened as dear dear poor jordan peterson is he needs jesus as his savior and doesn't have him yet now peterson said i don't know who jesus is i take my notion of the ideal from jung so this is going to bring us to Jung, and um, uh, and it'd be tempting for me now to try and give you a lecture on Jung, and I'm going to try and avoid doing that, but I have to say a few things about him. So Jung, Jung essentially wants to replace God with the self, the emerging self with a capital S. And he has a map, 
for doing so. It's called individuation and it's the integration of the individual and the collective unconscious with our consciousness and it happens by engaging our unconscious in certain areas and, and one is that evil is located in our unconscious as shadow if you like inverted good and so it's a reconciliation of, of our inner darkness with our inner light that produces individuation well, this is a very dangerous idea and it's so far away of course it's partly true it is indeed partly true that there are aspects of ourself that we're frightened of that we experience as dangerous and dark in the shadow that need to be confronted and welcomed. And to that extent, Jung is right. But not at the expense of losing any sense of metaphysical, objective evil that we find in the Gospels. Uh, and that, of course, is the, the, the great danger. Uh, Jung, too, wants a... a, a reconciliation of sexuality within us so he thinks that you know we all contain the opposite within us if you're a man you contain the archetypal eternal feminine within you and you need to meet it introduce it welcome it integrate it and if you're a woman the archetypal masculine and so you can see in a way how this sliding scale of sexuality where you can just move uh, from one to the other along a scale is very much given permission by Jung's notion of a of a sliding scale with two poles that have to meet in the middle and be, 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 be fused in some mutual acceptance of opposites. Uh, and, and, and Jung thinks that, that uh, again quite rightly, that the world is full of archetypal figures that, that, if you like, correspond to shapes that we long for in ourselves. So whereas Augustine will say that there is only one archetypal figure and it's God, and until we meet God, we, we long for him and we'll go on long for, longing for him until the God-shaped hole in us is met by the god shape who is God himself. But Jung dethrones God at this point and says, no, it's not God. God is, there is no, not one archetype and it's not the creator. There are many archetypes and here's what they look like. And again, he's partly right. You know, all the stories, the adventure stories, the stories of rescue, they all have an, an archetypal heroic figure whether it's Frodo in Lord of the Rings or, uh, or, or Peter and Lucy in the Narnia stories uh, or, or uh, you know why, why is it that Alexander the Great is, is what he is why, do, why is the great man of history theory so compelling because we're always looking for a saviour figure uh, so to some extent Jung is right but what he doesn't allow is for a metaphysical world in which Jesus is the saviour, not just acting like a saviour figure. Peterson intellectually is there. He, he talks about the astonishing congruence between fact and value. So in terms of, of confronting atheists like Sam Harris, uh, Peterson has seen enough of the real world, the mixture of the spiritual, uh, the spiritually good and, and the material to be able to present a holistic view of, of the world as contingent upon a greater good, a greater order, a hierarchy, which God is at the top or the center. But, but this is still, but, so he's no longer, an, he's not an atheist, but it's only stage one. Do you remember reading about C.S. Lewis? Lewis had two conversions. He had a conversion away from atheism. I knelt the most reluctant ex-atheist in Christendom. But he needed a second conversion to Christ, which is what he had through his conversations with Tolkien and his other Christian friends. Now, Peterson is stuck between conversion one and conversion two. He's read his Lewis. It's interesting that, that he hasn't understood Lewis yet in this respect. So here we have Peterson converted from atheism, particularly by his perception of the congruence of fact and value, but not yet falling in love with Jesus and knowing that he cannot make it by his intellect alone by his pursuit of virtue alone it's as if peterson is the good jew he wants to do it by the law by by the by the muscle that we've been given virtue and intelligence and it doesn't do it he has to fall flat on his face and will have to give up 
and cry out Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, like Peter did on the Sea of Galilee as he's sinking and reach out to Jesus and be saved. He's not there yet. We have to pray for him. It's a process. People have asked me, said to, to Peterson in this interview, if I believe in God and I say no, but I want to act as if God exists. But it's possible I might believe in God, he says, and I'm terrified. He hasn't found yet the mercy of God. He's right to be terrified of God. In, in so many ways, Christians are not as terrified as God as we ought to be. We ought to be terrified of his nuclear holiness, which him, which 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 scrutinizes us and finds every every shadow, every perversion, every distortion, every mark of sullying upon us. Peterson instinctively knows that. And he's terrified of God. And he realizes too that, that if he believes in God, a whole load of things may follow. I have to say that he'll also be experiencing the demonic voice that brings in a perfectionism to keep you from making the leap. I remember when I became a Christian, uh, I was teaching on the verge of it. I, I provisionally committed myself. And then this voice came into my head saying, if you become a Christian, you'll have, you'll have to share all your goods in common. That's what Christians do. And that means anyone's going to be able to play or borrow your flute. Now, I had a very beautiful flute. I was a flautist. I, I played for a little while as, as, a, as a dep in the BBC Academy Orchestra. I, I, I No one touched my flute. <laughs> it was a... Uh, it actually wasn't that good but it was at the time it was quite good and and I had this voice saying you'll you have to share your flute and this was a lie I now know looking back that it was a demonic lie demons whispering in the ear trying to overbalance you and in a way that's what's going to be happening to Jordan Peterson he's going to be told that 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 a half truth that if he believes in God his whole world is going to have to go and, and then and then the demonic voice will ratchet it up and say, this is too much, too terrifying, too awful, too threatening. You won't be able to cope because they won't tell you that as you let go of the old world, you get caught by the new and you are not between the two trapezes for more than a nanosecond before you're embraced by heaven and held tight and safe. But he'll hear a voice terrifying him. He's clearly heard it. And he's frightened of believing in God. He doesn't yet know that Jesus the Saviour will do what he did to Peter and save him on the Sea of Galilee. He looks too at the critique of the Catholic Church and says, like so many people do, well, if, if this place can be so corrupt and have so many sins, how can I possibly believe? Is this, is this the collective integrity of what happens when people believe in Christ? If so, it's a crock of something and I can't possibly accept it. Some of you will have heard me tell the story of an old lady who became a Catholic Christian in the 1980s because it was a crock, because she saw the Borgias on television. And she'd also seen Mother Teresa. And, and she said to herself, in answer to the question, how can the church contain, legitimately contain, both the Borgias, incest, rape, anger, power, greed, horror, perversity, and Mother Teresa, this saintly woman who pulls children out of dustbins. How, how is that possible? And a lot of people say, well, it's not possible, so I can't possibly believe. She came to the view that, that instead of the Borgias ruining Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa sanctified the Borgias. And you have to choose which side, which way you're going to do the equation. Once again, the, you know, the, the voices in our head will, will, will um, invite us to go the, the, the Peterson way. But, but but the little old lady way is equally valid. A church that's been corrupted by evil. But in, in evil, of course, evil assaults the church. Of, of course, evil delights to pervert priests and bishops and cardinals and monks and saints. That's what evil does. It's its job. We should not be surprised to find the church under constant attack, constant perversity. The question is, how does it deal with that perversity? And the answer is it gets on its knees and it prays for forgiveness and it repents and it puts things right and it starts again. That's Christian. But you never hear that talked about. That's the Christian gift that we have. And so quite rightly, the little old lady sees Mother Teresa as the antidote to the Borgias. So yes, 
there's been some the church has done the most appalling things we in the church have done the most appalling things we including me perhaps including you have failed in the most ghastly ways known only to god and our confessors and the reasons why facing the charge of hypocrisy we don't give up is because we're offered forgiveness on condition of repentance and we grab it with both hands because we don't want to be condemned by by our frailty by our own perversions by our inner distortions by our sin by our rebellion by our lusts by our appetites we don't want to be condemned by those things and jesus says you don't have to be if you repent because i've paid the price so that's how we can belong to a church with perversity in it because we expect the perversity that's not an excuse not for a moment and for all those who've been wounded by the church um, all all any of us can do is to say how appalling that is but that one either stays with the wounds and cries out for justice or recognize that we're all in the same boat um, and, and make our way into the forgiveness that lies at the heart of the Christian church The struggle with sin and repentance, the, sorry, the struggle is with sin uh, and the answer is repentance. Moral idealism won't carry us to God. Moral idealism will not mend the church. Moral idealism will not defend the church. Only repentance, only Kyrie eleison, only Lord have mercy on me, a sinner, and the forgiveness that Christ won on the cross will. He goes on to say a version of that christians he says don't manifest the transformation of attitude that allows the observer to believe they believe <laughs> in other words looking at us who would believe in god when they look at our lives well that's a that's perfectly that's a perfectly reasonable reasonable thing to say and and, and it's hard to know how to respond except say that there are some christians who we look at and we want to believe i mean there's a there's a, a priest in the concentration camp who gave up his life for someone and was gassed instead of a Jew. And you look at that and you say, I can believe. You look at people like Mother Teresa, C.S. Lewis, some of your favourite saints, for me, Padre Pio, uh, Seraphim of Sorov, for some people, St. Francis of Assisi. And you say, yeah, looking at those people, I... I can believe, I, I see what's possible in the lives of some people who said yes to God. Even if people can't see what's possible when they look at my life because I haven't said yes to God enough. But some have. But it is a perfectly proper critique to say I can't believe because if that's, you know, if, if the church is the, the evidence of transformed Christianity, you know, then... I can't believe. But of course it isn't just that. The church is also a hospital. It's a training ground for saints, but it's also a hospital for sinners. It's where people crawl to on their knees in order to find forgiveness. That is also the church. And it would be wrong to say it is it is to see only see the church in one dimension. We have to see it in two dimensions. And so in a way Peterson is being slightly unfair. Um, it, it's an unfairness that uh, is entirely we bring upon ourselves by our flaws and our frailties and our rebellion uh, and our constant sinning. And it's a legitimate criticism. But it's also legitimate to say it's not the only way to look at the church. There is another way. It's a hospital. Uh, I, I was very moved by um, Rod Dreher who said that um, uh, he met his wife by going to see a weeping icon of Mary. And both he and his wife had become interested in Mary. And uh, they, 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 they met there, they said their prayers, they decided to get married at this, in front of this, this icon. And uh, this propelled them into a life of Christianity and, and, and joyful marriage together. And they discovered that the priest who was the custodian of the icon was a fraud 
the whole thing was a setup, a con. It was a fake. The icon was made to weep. It wasn't real. There are real weeping icons. This wasn't one of them. And not only that, but that, but that, but the priest was guilty of all kinds of sexual perversion and sin. And Rod Dreher said, on the day of judgment, when this man quite rightly comes to face the truth about his immorality, on the day of judgment, I will be there at the foot of the cross, standing up for him, because there was goodness also as well as deep perversity that came out of what he did my life was blessed i have a wife i have a children i have a family i have a faith and in a very odd way this perversity couldn't stop goodness flowing out from the church and touching Rondrea. and when i read i will be standing there pleading for his forgiveness i almost burst into tears because, I, because that is the other side of, of, of faith and of this mysterious economy that is both justice and mercy that we all face. And I hope there'll be people at my judgment standing as I have to face up to the full and awful truth about my own journey saying, but I came to eternal life, to forgiveness through that incompetent, willful, wounded man's life and i hope god will count it as righteousness in the final economy of what happens not that i know how judgment works <laughs> that's beyond any of us a mixture of jesus on the cross and our own accountability Peterson said, how do I reconcile myself to this constant pain that I'm in? And, and, and Jonathan Paggio quite rightly said, this is not the moment for me to moralise at him. How do any of us reconcile? There was one point in my life when, when I was in such a crisis that on my way to work, I used to go by bike so that I could go on a, on a dual carriageway and shout at God my pain, my rage, my anger, my bewilderment, my frustration. And it was to say, how could you allow me to be in this appalling place? And there was only one place where I could let this out. It was on a bike on a dual carriageway on the way to work. And so I don't take lightly Peterson saying, how can I reconcile myself to this constant pain? Except to say that, that the way in which we deal with pain as Christians is a very important part of being a Christian. St Paul has this mysterious passage in Colossians where he says in 1.24, Now I, re I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. This is behind the whole notion that Catholics have particularly of offering up suffering on behalf of somebody else on behalf of, of, of Christ, on behalf of the church, on behalf of somebody else's own sin, suffering in some very profound alchemical, metaphysical way can become redemptive by, by just by the act of bearing it in love. I have to say this is a mystery that I'm still trying to, to digest and understand and live through and work through. And um, the, the, There was a moment... Uh, I'm trying to write a book about my journey to Catholicism and, and it's hard to know how much one should say about one's, 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 one's private moments. But there was a point when I was in Teze and uh, I was saying to Jesus, you need to take some of this pain away. You, you need to come and rescue me. <laughs> this, is, this is too much. Late at night in Teze, on the hill in Burgundy, this ecumenical monastery, <clears throat> the people in real pain would stay praying, singing and praying long into the night. And um, I was there. And suddenly, to my great surprise, the Lord appeared to me on the cross and spoke to me and said, I, I will 
I will help you with your pain, but first of all, will you help me with mine? And I, I, I said, Lord, I, I don't know what you mean. Will you come onto the cross and bear my pain? Well, what else could I say? But yes. And I found myself in the spirit, I don't know, in some, in some sense, in some very real sense, lifted onto the cross and being crucified. And within a very short time, indeed, I said, Lord, you have to put me down. This is too difficult. This, this, this pain in my chest, in my neck, in my arms, in my hands, where the nails have gone through, this is, this is, too, this is too fierce. And the Lord put me down. And I, I understood why Catholics have crucifixes, why Jesus is still on the cross, in a sense. Protestants are wrong to say, to mock and say, he's off the cross, he's risen. Because in the same way as we were dealing with time and space beforehand, time and space being permeated by the Christ event, Christ remains crucified for our sins. And he asks us to continue what he asked in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. We find, we find uh, Helena Faustina, we find Therese of Lisieux, Therese of Avila, all being asked to stay with Christ in the sacrament and, and share in his suffering on our behalf. How can I reconcile myself to constant pain as a Christian in some of these ways? But it is awfully difficult. Peter went on to say, I have the choice of believing two impossible things, that the incarnation is true or that humans invented it all. They're both impossible, he said. <laughs> well, that's absolutely right. Um, and uh, um, uh, he has to choose. And we're hoping he'll choose the incarnation is real, but he hasn't done it yet. He goes on to say that the psyche is the ground of, of our existence. Well, this is Jung. No, no, it's not. It, it is it's, God is the ground of our being. This was Tillich in, in the 1960s, and, uh, and, it, and it's profoundly true. It's not the only truth, but, but it's more true than to say the psyche is the ground of our existence. Uh, Jung, uh, Peterson talks about a book of Jung's Called, called the Ion, where he looks at the convergence of Christianity and, and, and the symbol of the fish uh, and wonders if, if Jung was right about this and wonders how the unconsciousness has, has located the fish with Christianity and talks about the value of astrological signs and so on. I think the answer to this is, is, the, is the answer that C.S. Lewis gave when he discovered that uh, in the East there were all kinds of stories about virgin births and gods and People said, see, Christianity is just one of these. And he said, no, you've, you've, you've got the causation the wrong way around. Because the virgin birth and God becoming human is, is the key to everything, you will find echoes of it everywhere, prefiguring echoes. Uh, and that, I think, is what, what Jung was discovering in terms of the overlap between astrological science and Christian symbolism. Um, I don't understand, said Peterson, why all these archetypal truths should be manifested in history in the incarnation. And, and at this point, he either has forgotten or he has not yet read Anselm and Augustine. We cannot get to belief by understanding. Christianity is wrecked by our intellectuals who have tried to sieve the whole miracle and mystery of sacramentalism and incarnation and metaphysics uh, and reducing it to what their brains could cope with and here's Peterson doing the same thing I, I, I can't get all this into my, my intellectual framework and Anselm said quite rightly neque enem quado intelligere ut credam said credo ut intelligam I don't seek to understand in order I may believe but I believe in order I may understand it only works when you start believing. This is terrifying, of course, because it means you have to make the leap of faith. But it's true. It only works when you believe. And when you believe, then you understand. But it's the age-old mistake of the intellectual, of the clever man, of the, of the enlightenment above all, to say that until my mind is satisfied, well, of course, it actually goes back to Thomas, doesn't it? Until I can put my fingers in, until it's proved to me, 
until you reduce yourself to my categories of determination. It's a form of egocentricity and pride. Amazingly, Jesus gave Thomas what he needed. But you have to make the leap of faith in most circumstances. There was a marvellous moment when uh, Jonathan talked about Pete's and going to church and squirming. <laughs> I'm feeling very uncomfortable about it because, because he's not yet surrendered. And yet at the same time he was said in this interview, Peterson said Catholicism is as sane as people ever get. A wonderful phrase. And people don't get very sane, but Catholicism is as sane as it gets, which is a nice balancing uh, observation to his, I can't believe if the church is transformed people in him. So he himself also has other sides of the coin which he says later on people would be more insane without it than they are with it um, and then he asks is belief something do you just believe or do you courageously assume it and of course in the end it is it is the sleep of faith i know some people don't like the phrase but but it's a you have to decide to kill the ego there's a wonderful bit in lewis where where uh, in a great divorce, a man is dealing with a demon of lust on his shoulder, and the angel on the other shoulder says, "You've got to, you've got to say no to it. You've got to. It's become part of you. You've got to let me kill part of you to save you." And and he says, "No, no, 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 no. You can't." And then and then finally he cries, out, "I can't do it. You do it for me." And the angel takes the the demon of lust that's grown on his shoulder and breaks its neck, and and the sexual energy then turns into a that's being killed and sacrificed, and turns into this extraordinary horse. Um, which carries the penitent into heaven. There are times when we say, I, I can't, Lord, like, like, like the man who, like the parent who says, Lord, uh, come and help my unbelief. Um, we have to say the same thing. We have to ask him for help. And finally, Jordan Peterson doesn't understand heaven, <clears throat> but has this very important conversation about utopianism and says what's the relationship between heaven on earth and heaven up there in one sense it's right at the heart of what we do every day when we pray the lord's prayer thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as in heaven what's the relationship between our utopianisms our, our, our towers of babel our idealism do we do we put feeding the poor first before anything else or do we do we build churches first and and jonathan patcher says quite rightly the sword that slices through this Gordian knot is worship. If you worship God, everything else comes right, including feeding the poor. And Jesus said the same thing when he said, seek you first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added to you. Get your priorities right. Worship God right. And the politics falls into place. Make politics your God. Make the utopia your God. Make equality of outcome your God. And you are in such trouble. It is the will of God that comes first, the worship of God. It was a very, very moving part of the conversation. Um, does the fact that that's, that that's how it is, does the fact that that's how it should be, rather, mean that's the way it actually is? Is the idealism I've grasped, does the fact that I've grasped it mean that it's true? And, and Jonathan says, yes, but you only know it by love and trust. Only once more, again, the virtues of love and trust, not power and, and, and belief, not, not the brain. The heart comes first. And Peterson says at the end, I, I just don't know what to do with this. I'm the most confused person I ever met, and I've met some very confused people. And the heart bleeds for him because he's got right to the edge of the kingdom of heaven. There's going to come a point where he's going to have to fall on his knees and ask to be saved. Many people are praying for him. He's been a great warrior for the truth, a very brave, heroic figure. But he needs Jesus if he's not to be crushed by standing in the middle of this great confrontation between good and evil that our times particularly have produced. And he is a... He is a rebuke to us to be more confident about the riches that we have in the Bible, to be more confident 
about the revelation we've been given, to be more confident, less apologetic about hierarchies, about order, about redemption. He's calling the church out on its weakness. And maybe it's because the church, because some of us have been so weak-kneed <laughs> that God has raised up a kind of, a kind of Cyrus figure uh, to, to tell the truth on our behalf because we haven't done it. Our bishops haven't done it. Our prophets haven't done it. Our evangelists haven't done it enough. So perhaps we should, we the church, should step up to the mark and that would let Peterson, lead Peterson off the hook. We have intellectuals who can do this too. But it's taken Peterson to find the courage to stand in the public space and confront the demonic wokeness that is going for the jugular of all that Christ came to do. Let's pray for him. And let's also be grateful to him for the clarity he's brought to us for what the kingdom of heaven is, what our priorities are. And as we look at the transfiguration, to take seriously our struggle with Satan on the one hand and this theosis, I haven't discussed that, huge subject, but this transformation is not individuation, it's not the reconciliation of opposites, it's not the development of all potential, which is the Jungian story, it is theosis, it's sanctification, it's, it's, it's Christ being born in us and us becoming like Christ, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the transfiguration is about. It tells us in the way that Christ was transfigured and transformed, so will we be. The light of the Spirit of Christ will so burn and shine within us that we too are on the road to transformation and transfiguration. To God be the glory forever and ever. If you stayed through with me through this whole hour, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm sure we'll, I hope we'll have a, a good conversation in the comments below. God bless you.